All right, so the topic of our video today is 2.2 day one, and this is characteristics of linear functions. So most of us have seen a linear function before. We kind of know what to expect from a linear function, and we're going to talk about what those are a little bit in depth and some of the different forms that we can see linear functions are. Um, but what we're going to try to treat this as is the same way that we did our polynomials and really try to understand the function part of it, not the fact that this is just going to be straight lines. So our objective today is to simply just identify and apply the key characteristics of a linear function. So like I said before, we're going to look at the characteristics that we have for a linear function, um, understand them in the way that we now understand functions, and how we want to understand functions with the different properties that they may or may not have. So the first thing that we're going to look at is just the definition of what a linear function is. And so obviously you can see that we have a linear function here, um, most notably we know that linear functions are basically going to be straight lines. And that's important to understand so that we can just kind of understand what we're looking for. We saw parabolas with um, what we call quadratic functions, and now we see straight lines with what we call linear functions. But a linear function, by definition, is a relationship between two variables whose graph ends up being a straight line. Now, what we're going to find out is the type of relationship. Um, what we want to know is that this is a constant relationship. And that meaning that the relationship is the same um, no matter where we are on that graph. So the relationship between the two variables is constant throughout the entire graph. It never changes. The relationship with a quadratic change, and that's why we had the shape that we did, but this relationship will not change. And so a couple of things that we need to kind of identify here as far as being part of the graph. Um, so one of the things that we've kind of already recognized is that this is our y-intercept. So we just have to make sure that we understand what our y-intercept is and how to find it. We also kind of already know x-intercepts. And we already know x-intercepts, and we can kind of still remember those as being zeros. And the fact that this is linear doesn't change the fact that an x-intercept is one of the zeros of the graph. And with linear functions, we're always going to get one zero. Uh, we'll never get any more than that. We'll never get any less than that unless it's a um, slope of zero, which we'll eventually get to. The next thing that we have to look at is we can also characterize our slope. And so most of us know our slope as being rise over run. So this is the rise, and this is the run. So if we look at slope, I'll put slope down here, is rise over run as a fraction. And then that way we can easily identify what our slope is. And also remember that we can also do that above the graph. So it doesn't matter whether we use rise over run above or below the line. It really doesn't make a difference. One of the things that we need to add to this, though, um, is not just our x-axis and our y-axis. So I'm going to label my x-axis and my y-axis. And what we're going to have to look at today is we're going to have to look at what changes get made with this x and y-axis rather than just being something very basic. Um, the first thing is that our x-axis is going to be labeled by our independent variable. And so when we talk about an independent variable, we have to understand that independent variables act alone. Um, they're not influenced by anything else. So we just have to make sure that when we look at an independent variable, we're looking at the x-axis. And we've kind of already started talking about independent variables, and we kind of recognize that time is independent. Um, but the idea is that x is going to be our independent variable. Our y-axis, or our our y variable is going to end up being our dependent variable. Now, with the dependent variable, what that basically is going to say is that whatever x is, y depends on whatever that is going to be. And so we just have to make sure that we're going to correctly identify independent variables and dependent variables as we move along. Now, the next thing that we have to identify with some of these things um, is the idea that the x-axis is known as our input. So this is the values that we're going to put in, and the y-axis is going to be known as our output. We kind of already understand that idea, input-output, uh, but we just have to make sure that we identify those as such.
And finally, one more word for our kind of um, x-axis and y-axis is not only is it input, not is it only the independent variable, uh, but this is what we call the domain. Uh, the domain of a function is all the representative x values that we can use, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but we should at least be aware that this is our domain, and then our y-axis is our range. So we just have to be able to understand and be able to identify what these values are, and we're going to be talking about them eventually too as well. So just like any other good function, um, a linear function has three different forms that we could ever see them in. Uh, the first one is going to be our standard form, which is noted as ax plus by equaling c, where a, b, and c are not zero. Um, it's just something that we don't want to have as far as zero. Um, a and b can be zero, but we really don't want, um, or c can be zero, um, and a can be zero, but we really don't want b zero, so b does not equal zero. And the reason that we don't want b equals zero is because that eliminates our y and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of, of a function. So the purpose of our standard form here, the first one is finding intercepts. And so we can use our standard form to very easily find our intercepts. That would be our x and y intercepts. Not just the y, but also the x. And it also is really good at showing relationships. So it can at least show the relationship between x and y and how they're interacting um, between each other. Um, our slope-intercept form, which most of us will know by now, where m is our slope and b is our y-intercept. What that does is it obviously shows us our slope and our intercept, and that's kind of the reason that it's named slope-intercept form. Um, but the best thing that we can use this for is to quickly graph and make what we call our table of values. So we can easily graph slope-intercept form by using the slope and the y-intercept, but it also helps us make a table of values. The point slope form is something that we've kind of seen before where you have x1 comma y1 as being an ordered pair that we know about the graph and m again is our slope. Um, so this is a situation in which we're given a point, we're given a slope and we're trying to you know at least find some information about this. Uh, but the idea here is we're going to use point slope form um, to help us find equations. Now, the reason that we're going to say that we find equations with that is because there are certain situations which we can't use standard form and slope-intercept form because we're going to need to know a particular ordered pair to kind of help us out with what we're doing. Um, and so the point-slope form will simply help us just find some equations. All right, so now that we kind of got the rest of that out of the way, um, now what we can do is we can look at graphing our linear functions. Now graphing our linear functions is pretty easy depending on the situation that we're given. Um, and so the first way is the slope way, um, which most of us are familiar with. So if I give you the equation y equals 2 thirds x plus 3, the first thing that we're going to do in order to graph this is we're going to graph the y-intercept. And our y-intercept in this situation, if we think about our um, slope-intercept form, this is m and this is b, and b is our y-intercept. So our y-intercept in this case is 0, 3. And so the idea is that we can go ahead and we can plot 0, 3 right here on the graph. That's our y-intercept. And then the second thing that we can do is we can identify our slope. Our slope here is 2 over 3. And remember our slope is rise over run. And so what we can do is now we can use the slope, so now we're on step three, we're going to use the slope to plot a second point by counting from the y-intercept. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here at this y-intercept, and I'm going to go up two and over three, and I'm going to plot a second point. And so that's how we would plot a function with our slope-intercept form. And then we can go ahead and just simply draw a line through those two points, and now we have a linear function. So graphing linear functions is really easy so long as we just know simply two points. Um, so need two points to graph. So as long as we have two points, we can graph any linear function because all we're doing is creating a straight line. We don't need to know what's going before that or what's after that to try to see where it's curving because we, all, we always will know that it's a straight line. And so like I showed you here, this is my rise over run. 2 over positive 3. 
The next way that we can graph linear functions is the intercept way. So let's say we're not given something in slope-intercept form where we can easily identify the slope or easily identify the y-intercept. Because when we're given something like this in standard form, this really doesn't tell us much of anything um, other than the coefficients of x and y. And so what we can do is we can find the two intercepts. We can find our x-intercept and find our y-intercept. Because if you think about it, that's still two points. And so in order to find the x-intercept, all we have to do is plug in y equals 0 into our function. So let's go ahead and do that. So it would be negative 4x plus 2 times 0 equals 16, which would simplify to negative 4x equals 16. And then now, in order to find my intercept, all I would have to do is solve this for x. So divide by negative 4, and x equals negative 4 when I divide 4 by 16. So the idea is to find the x-intercept, I just plug in y equals 0. We've kind, of, we've kind of set this situation up with finding zeros, because if you think about it, in order to find x-intercepts with our quadratics, we set the whole thing equal to 0, or we set y equal to 0. And that's kind of the same idea here, except the linear stuff is a little bit more straightforward, and we don't have to worry about trying to do all those different methods of solving. So I have an x-intercept of negative 4, so I can go and I can go plot that at x equals negative 4. So here's my x-intercept. Now I can find the y-intercept in a similar fashion. So if I want to find the y-intercept, I plug in x equals 0. So negative 4 times 0 plus 2y equals 16. And now I'm going to go ahead and just solve for y. So that would be 2y equals 16, and then y equals 8. So now I have my other point. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's my y-intercept. And now all I have to do is graph the points and connect with a straight line, and there you have it. So that's how we would graph using intercepts. So just understanding the basic principle of plugging in y equals 0 or x equals 0 to find the other intercept. So if we're finding the x-intercept, we make y 0 because we're solving for x. And if we want to find the y-intercept, we plug in x equals 0, which we're solving for y. Finally, what we can look at is if you don't like standard form, so maybe we don't like using standard form or we want to put this in slope-intercept form so that we can easily identify the slope or we can easily find everything else. So in order to simply convert to slope-intercept form, all we have to do is solve for y. So we're going to use our steps of algebra to kind of help us go through this and solve for y. So what I want to do first is I want to isolate the y term. Um, so in this case, I'm going to isolate this positive 2y, so I'm going to add 4x to both sides. And so what I'm left with is 2y equaling 4x plus 8. Now the reason that I put that first is because if you think about slope-intercept form, slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. So I always want that x term to be first, and it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Whatever we did, if we added it, it's positive. If we subtracted it, it's going to be negative. We can just put that in front because we want to have it in that form. Um, so don't be afraid to be able to use these and manipulate them because it really doesn't make a difference where we put them so long as we keep them either positive or negative. Now that I have 2y by itself, now I need to get y by itself, and so I'm going to divide by 2. Now here's the tricky part. Whenever we're converting into standard form, what we're going to do is typically we would divide both sides by 2. But since we have multiple pieces over there, what we're going to do is we're going to divide everything by 2. This is very similar to when we were using our um, complex numbers and we were looking at simplifying those. Whenever we divide one side by the other side or anything like that, we're going to divide every single piece that's there. We could do the same thing with multiplication. We would multiply every single piece. So instead of dividing the entire thing by 2 and then trying to do something different, what I can do is I can just simply divide every term by that same value. And as long as I do it with every term, nothing will go wrong. So the 2's will cancel, so I get y equals 4 divided by 2, which is 2x plus 4. And then now I have my slope-intercept form. So I can do that no matter what I'm doing. Just make sure that you divide every single term by that same value that you're dividing by. And that's how we take standard form and convert it to slope-intercept form. And that's actually going to do it for this video. We're going to look in class of different ways that we can use this now that we've at least learned to identify the different pieces.